If you've been camping, well done. <laughs> uh, I hope you got some sleep in the night. Uh, I always think the age of your children when you go camping tells you a lot about ha how, how fierce you are about it. If you've been camping with under fives, you're heroes. Well done. It's great to be here. Uh, my name is Ed Drew. I'm the director of Faith in Kids. Uh, we are particularly working with under 11s, and we're trying to help parents feel confident that they are the ones who can raise their children, and we're trying to help churches to thrive. If those two work together, the magic happens, okay? Uh, I'm going to start by giving uh, something of an introduction to the big picture of parenting. Then we're going to work on this morning to move on to, uh, I, I guess, the, the groundwork of gratitude and how the Lord works in our families to bring that gratitude about. And then tomorrow, uh, we're going to then look at some practical ways, some difficulties, some objections, and some barriers. Okay, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you for joining me. Now, uh, three Bible verses to find our bearings. This is probably the most well-known one on parenting in the Bible, Proverbs 22.6. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they're old, they will not turn from it. The surprise for me with this verse is it doesn't tell you what the way is. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they're older, they won't depart from it. You could even say, start them off on any way, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. There is no such thing as a sort of a la carte menu. As much as we would love our children to reach some wonderful age where they sit down and say, I shall now weigh the wisdom from my parents and I shall leave aside their failings and I shall take only the excellence that they have taught me. The sad news of this is no, they just take the whole load with them. Uh, I used to work in a washing powder factory. I discovered, because I used to talk about washing powder too much and I still know quite a lot about it, <laughs> almost everyone when you ask them why they use the washing powder they do, they say either it's the cheapest or more likely, more often, it's the one my mum used. How endearing is that? When it came to washing clothes, my mum had it down and I won't depart from the way she did it. This verse is also saying it's the reason we send children to school and not our pensioners. The first years are the most significant. It's such a blindingly obvious statement. But I'm afraid it just ups the ante for parenting. You'll never, ever have a more significant time than the first two years of your child's life. If you're through that, don't worry, you've still got plenty of time. But the development that is happening is that it's most significant from those early years. It's so clearly, obviously true. Developmental experts tell us that by the age of nine, a child's moral framework is mostly built. By the age of nine, they know right from wrong. They know who to trust. They know when to steal, when to lie, when to tell the truth, and when to give away. If you think of a child of about nine, <laughs> that's mostly happening. They're choosing. They're choosing when to be morally right and morally wrong. By the age of about 13, there is a spiritual framework that is built. Is there an unseen world? Is there a God? Are there angels? Is God good? Is God bad? Do I trust him? Do I hate him? Or do I refuse to believe he exists? Or do I know he exists? And I've just found it too painful socially to follow him. By the age of 13, that's happening. And just to stick another date in, I find when you ask a seven-year-old about their class in school, they say, everyone's a Christian. When you ask an eight-year-old, they say, I'm the only Christian. It changes a huge amount when they move from, my family is the normal one, we are all trusting Jesus, to I am the only Christian I know and my family are the weirdest family. We have to, as parents, just bear in mind this is happening. But we also just have to ride the wave. Parenting is an adventure. 
I'm not sure there are many aspects of our lives where we so openly feel totally clueless. We're waiting for the parenting USB stick just to pop in behind our ear, but no one shows us that. The, uh, my, my first child was born at 6 a.m. in the morning. It was an incredibly traumatic night. It came, uh, she slept through the first day of her life. At 8 p.m., it was time for me to leave the hospital, my wife and her to stay behind. I was secretly relieved to be leaving and going home, but I didn't say that out loud. I had my hand on the doorknob to leave. And Mary said from the bed, just one thing, Ed, uh, what do I do if she wakes up? <laughs> Honestly, no lie, that was the first time I realised neither of us had a clue. <laughs> if pressed, I would have said, I'm totally clear, I have no clue. Broadly, a book was handed to me about once a month for the 10 months previously. But it was absolutely terrifying to hear that my wife had no clue either. <laughs> I honestly believed that somehow God had so designed women that they just knew, because as I look at mums, what a fantastic bunch they are. They always have wet wipes in their bags. <laughs> and I just thought God had just sort of done the USB sticker behind the ear thing. We're on this journey from the very start. And I just want us to know it's all right that we don't know what we're doing. That is literally the reason we're Christians. And it might be in parenting that we are clearest why we're Christians. That there is someone else we are trusting. There is someone else who has them. There is someone else who loves our children more than we do. There is someone else who knows them better than we do. There is someone else who has them for more of the time, all of the time, than we do. Deuteronomy 6. Moses standing on the edge of the promised land. What a moment. We are going into the land God has given us. The people are standing before him. He is giving them the idiot's guide of living for the Lord. We have been wandering for 40 years. The whole generation who was promised the land have died out. You are now going to grasp it. You are now going to live the life. You are now going to have life as good as it gets. This is what you need to know. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Jesus said it's the most important commandment. He quoted it from here. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. You're to bleed this stuff. You're to live this stuff. You're to love the Lord with all your hearts, with all your feelings, with all your emotions, with all your creativity, with all your heads, with all your intellect, with all your logic and your rational thought, with all your soul, with all your spiritual being, with all that you are. And you're to impress them on your children. The first sentence that follows, worship God. In the fullest sense, the first thing that God's people are told are, get busy with your kids. And this is to the whole of God's people. I celebrate that I, by looking at all of you, I'm going to make the educated guess that some of you aren't parents or your grandparents or your leaders. You're joining this great adventure. You're side by side, you're in God's people, and you are impressing them on our children. Uh, my son didn't get into the Keswick 11s to 14s group. We told him it was mostly to do with his behaviour. <laughs> it was actually because they're short of leaders. It's an incredibly hard time to find leaders after COVID. It's the story across churches. It's the story across conferences and conventions. It is a hard time to find leaders. My 14-year-old wonderfully just said, how hasn't Keswick got the leaders? I said, Beth, I look forward to the day in not many years when you get to spend your week looking after other people's children. 
you will see how hard and how wonderful it is. But to have the saints waiting for our children when they've never met them before to impress them, to impress God onto them for a week. How amazing it is to be doing this together. Talk about, talk about them when you sit at home. That's the Lord's commands. When you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Following God is not just for Sundays. Have you talked about God at the top of cat bells? Yes. Have you talked about God as you swim out to the island? Have you talked about God as you watch the Commonwealth Games? Have you talked about God as you walk into your program, as you pray together? And have you prayed and given thanks as you walk out the program? Have you sung as you get up and as you go to bed? Have you read the Bible story before bed and have you prayed? Have you prayed in the tears and have you prayed in the laughter? Have you prayed before the meal? Have you prayed after the meal? And have you prayed when there's no meal? Moses says there's never a bad time to be talking of the things of God. Because the terrifying reality is that they're watching what we don't talk about. At what age do you think our children have worked out our priorities? At what age have our children worked out, when does dad not go to church? When do we as a family make prayer happen and when do we not make it happen? What comes in front of God for dad? When does dad sing the loudest? When does dad cheer the loudest? When does dad get up off the chair and lose all joy and self-control? And I'm a Middlesbrough fan. I have kissed men in Middlesbrough Stadium who I never met. <laughs> when Ravinelli got us through to the final of the European Cup, I kissed a man. He was sat next to me. I think I was slightly awkward afterwards, but we were both celebrating. <laughs> Fortunately, my son didn't see that. <laughs> but I'd like to think he'd say, Dad, I've never seen you do that in church. Why not? Because the things I hear from the pulpit are so much more exciting than Ravenelli's goal. You can write that down. Well done. Well done. You're, you've driven a long way to do this. If you are camping with an under five in the rain, you're doing this. If you've got an incredibly nice cottage, you're doing it, but not as well. <laughs> Ephesians 6 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. John T. was fantastic last night, explaining 2 Corinthians 9 to us. I loved it. You know the bit when he said, this looks like, this looks like the prosperity gospel? The people who are generous are going to get more? And John T. brilliantly explained that we have every spiritual blessing, and it may not be money, but it is, a, it is a promise of blessing. We have here a promise of blessing. Christian parenting works. If children obey their parents in the Lord, it's a simple system. God is the boss. He's placed parents in here. We're under them. God loves, we obey. Our children are loved, they obey. Children, parents, God. If we obey our parents as if in the Lord, we read so that it may go well with you and you may enjoy long life on the earth. We're going through a cost of living crisis. At the moment, there are live drills happening in the China Sea. Vladimir Putin has told us that the finger is on the button. Countries are invading nations. Christians around the world are being persecuted. The single greatest force 
in our communities for good is parents. There is no policy our government could put in place. There is no department that could be expanded. There is no amount of investment that could be put into the NHS or our armed services or our schools that would make the difference that parents do. You are doing it. That is the story of the Bible. It would be a miracle to me if there is one person at this convention who is a parent who will have a more significant ministry than that with their own children. Imagine, imagine living for 18 years, learning from, hearing and enjoying. Seeing the mistakes and hearing the apology. Seeing the tears of brokenness and hearing the hope of the joy. There is no other discipleship program that touches it. You're in it. Fathers, mothers, don't exasperate your children. <laughs> Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Oh. As this was read out to the church in Ephesus, and all the kids were sat sitting next door to mum and dad, as some are sat next door to their parents here. The reader who reads it out, got a letter from Paul. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Every mum and dad just pulls the shoulder of the child. Fathers, don't exasperate your children. Every child pulls the trouser leg of dad. Don't exasperate me. Because God, us, them. We have the best heavenly father. He doesn't exasperate us. The psalmist teaches we can shout and scream, but he doesn't exasperate us. What are you doing? But I know you're doing it well. That's what our kids get to say. What are you doing? But we pray they get to say, we know you're doing it well. Because... Wouldn't it be great if they could say of us, <laughs> with all the shouting and the slamming of the doors, the frustration and the irritation, I could say of them, they brought me up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Good job. One graph and then you'll have a chat. I used to be an engineer. The data says the Bible's true. This is a graph of the Bible opening, the singing, the praying Christians in our land, in the UK. They were asked, we were asked, when did you come to faith? 40% said under the age of five. 40% of Christians in our churches say they can't remember a time they weren't Christians. Hallelujah. They can't remember a time when mum didn't pray with them before bed, dad didn't open the Bible or carry them into church kicking and screaming. I had a mum of this age group put up her hand and say, Ed, just tell me, how much is a child of four meant to understand whether they're a Christian? The subtitle would have said, because my four-year-old absolutely doesn't. I got to say it's fine. I've never met the four-year-old who quite says this, although my colleague Amy told me she did. She says she remembers becoming a Christian age five. Most don't. But when you're 47, you can't remember a time you didn't. Those first four years are mostly spit, vomit, feeding, and watching the second go round slowly. But this graph says they're the most significant. The children aren't learning through in-depth conversations and discipleship. They're learning through the hug. They're learning through the care. They're learning that the Bible gets opened when there are tears. They're learning that when, the, when it's all going wrong, you pray first. Next 16% under the age of 11, we're up to 56. That's more than half of the UK church say so they came to faith before they left primary school. Second stat, exactly three quarters by the end of secondary school. Exactly three quarters of the UK church say so they came to faith by the end of secondary school. You're all done. By 18, it turns out. 
All the action is happening in the factory, it turns out. All the significant work. We're just fiddling around in the big marquee. It's done. Apparently, some people do become Christians as adults. Hallelujah for them. But when they do, you have had to take apart the framework and start from the ground. You've had, to build, you've had to destroy a framework and build a new one. It's much easier to build the Jenga pile right first time. Turn to your neighbour. What is a Christian distinctive of parenting? What is a Christian distinctive of parenting? Or just tell the person next to you how you're feeling and it's fine. <laughs> Who is Ravenelli? Questions like that are available for you. <laughs> Off you go. I'm, uh, I'm going to leave questions till the end. Uh, so, let's aim for their hearts, okay? Let's aim for their hearts. Uh, I'm going to do some fantastic artwork to work us through these verses. Okay, and that is to just work out what is it as a parent we can do. Well, how is it we're going to do this? Jesus said, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick, fig pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. Okay, you ready, team? Jesus says that if you want a strawberry, you have to get it from a strawberry bush. And if you want an apple, you'll never guess, Jesus says... You really do need an apple tree. Isn't it amazing that the Son of God left the throne room of heaven to walk this earth for such deep, deep insights? <laughs> it turns out Jesus wouldn't even have made the panel for Gardner's Question Time. <laughs> so there must be something he's about to tell us that is so staggeringly difficult and hard to believe that he has to give us an illustration this simple. That if you want a strawberry, you should probably go to a strawberry bush. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Jesus says there are two kinds of heart. If you can't see at the back, you're probably blessed. This is a good heart and this is a bad heart. God is the definition of all that is good. He is good. The absence of good is the absence of God. There is a good heart and there is a bad heart. And would you know it, the good heart produces fruit. Good actions, because that is a hand. Good words, that is a mouth and good thoughts. And Jesus said there is an equivalent bunch of actions, words, and thoughts that come from a bad heart. Okay? Again, we haven't got stuck yet. The issue is, the reason why this is so profoundly hard is that this is the route we all want to take. And the particular relevance to parenting is this is the route it's so easy to take. A bad heart producing good words and actions. If you shout loud enough, our children might share. I was in a doctor's waiting room with a mum and her two children, about a four-year-old son, a three-year-old girl. There was one toy in the waiting room. It's a form of torture. The three-year-old girl picked it up first. The four-year-old son snatched it and took it into a corner. The mum said, share. The mum raised her volume and said, share again. I counted eight times the mum said, share. Eventually, the boy shared. We need to be clear that a bad heart will never share. There is one toy... 
He is the only person in his world, and he is bigger than the only other person who claims to be in his world. There is no reason for him to share. He will not share, unless the mum shouts loud enough, or unless his heart changes. We parent for the day when we are not there. That is the purpose of parenting. And on that day, it is entirely down to their heart. You will know, your reward chart on the fridge will no longer influence your 19-year-old. Your 19-year-old might well be taller than you. It will be really awkward if you're trying to intimidate them by shouting louder. A new bike probably won't cut it, but it might, briefly. This route here doesn't work, Jesus said. And we know that because it didn't work with us. Jesus did a slow, wonderful work here. And for some of us, it might have happened through our parents. So we can see that it took years. It may have happened miraculously, wonderfully quickly. That might be your story. Brilliant. But the key thing to understand is it's still this route and not this route that happened. We have to access the hearts of our children. And as I said, with a three or a four-year-old, accessing the heart of our children might come through a big hug. And it might come through words said quietly less than 30 seconds after the big bust up. But with 16 year olds, it might happen two weeks after the event. And it might happen with a Bible open, and it might happen with you apologizing and they apologize. And it might happen with a prayer at the end. Because some issues aren't fixed by shouting. If you imagine your best friend, Christian or not, is sat next to you on a park bench and tells you the greatest problem in their lives. The addiction, the marriage, the job, the finances. They finish telling their story. What do you do next? Option A, stop it! If you do that again, option B, I'll get you a new bike. Option C, thank you for telling me. Thank you for trusting me. Thank you for loving me. I'm going nowhere. I'm going nowhere. I'm going to stay here. We're going to do this together. I know how the gospel transforms this situation. I know the hope Christ offers. I may or not have experienced what you have experienced, but Christ can change how you're feeling. Should we pray together? I'll pray, because you might not want to. Well done. I know you're having those conversations. As your children get older, the issues get more complex. I have never prayed like I pray with my children when they are begging me not to go to school. There's no other time in my life I pray like that. There's no other time in my life I say, Lord, show up tomorrow or we're in real trouble. I cannot fix this. And to pray that in front of your children, I do believe is faith. And to have the courage to ask them when they come back from school, did God answer my prayer that I prayed with you last night? That's Christian parenting. To sit with your child and say, the gospel changes this. And we're going to pray together. Well done. Well done. We're looking at gratitude this week. If you were going to take the route that doesn't work, if you were going to take the route that doesn't work 
to raising grateful children. Talk to the person next to you about what it might look like. If you are only going to try and influence their behavior, do you follow what I mean? If you wanted them to do a grateful thing or say a grateful thing, if you were only trying to change what they said or did, maybe even just in a moment, or maybe over the next week, what would you do? Play that game. Turn to the person next to you. We're doing great. We're doing great. Last stretch. Before I come on to that, I just wanted to, to, to clarify. Um, there is room for discipline. Hebrews 13 explains that. Uh, that, that, that framework, I'm going to call it, because it makes it sound more technical. God, parent, child. Love. Authority. So that just simply means, as parents, we still get to say, no, that's wrong. In this family, we don't do that. We still get to say that. We should say that. There should be clear boundaries. I guess what we're talking about here is when, uh, you know, either, I mean, this might be the conversation about the boundary. This might be them owning the boundary. This might be them choosing to live like that. And boundaries are loving, and you learn from boundaries. Your heart is changed by boundaries. It is one way the Lord does it. You still get to shout shoes eight times without thinking, Ed says you can't do that. <laughs> Gratitude is an attitude. James 1.17 says this, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Every good and perfect gift comes from God into our life. Everything we have. Without him we would have absolutely nothing. And then what happens is that if we're truly thankful, if we're truly grateful, then we start to see some of those good things and those good blessings pouring out of our lives, this is a visual aid, <laughs> into the lives of others. Do you see that? You see what I've done there? Now, at the moment, people have understood there are mental health benefits in being grateful to one another. So as good things come out of our lives... I was talking to someone who works at the NHS here during John T's seminar. They said there's a thing at the moment to be grateful to others. So that is, we are to look for good things coming out of each other's lives, quite rightly, and we are to say thank you to them for them. But to do that is to forget there is someone who provides the good things. In our families, if we are only thanking one another for food, we are forgetting that there is someone else who has provided absolutely every good thing. And also to understand, it's because of God's goodness, it's because he is the source of every good thing, that we get to sacrifice for others. As he has sacrificed for us, we get to sacrifice for others. And parenting, let me tell you by the way, is a form of sacrifice. You are giving out. And if you forget or choose to ignore the fact that God has given to you, the sacrifice gets harder and harder and harder. It is a wonderful thing to know that God gives us every good thing as a parent. Because it means we don't dry up. We can give of ourselves freely sacrificially, without taking on a martyr complex. We have what the world doesn't have, which is we know there is one who keeps on giving. Without limit and without end. 
He is the source of every good thing, and from him we get to be parents. We get to give of ourselves. Because although we can train them to say thank you, they're nowhere near as grateful as they should be if they knew how many pants I've had to wash for them. <laughs> Philippians 4 says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. If we do it with thankfulness, we have that shalom. That is the promised land. An American author found the opposite of Philippians 4. Do not be calm about anything, but in everything, by dwelling on it constantly and feeling picked on it by God with thoughts like, and this is the thanks I get? Present your aggravations to everyone you know but him. And the acid in your stomach, which transcends all milk products, will cause you an ulcer, and the doctor bills will cause you a heart attack, and you will lose your mind. Now, with the exception of the doctor's bills, I think that translates to the UK fine. Now, that wasn't written only for parents. But I do think that to be a parent is to have to say repeatedly, Lord, you are being kind to me. These children are your greatest gift for me. You have hand-chosen the children I need to make me more godly. And as hard as it is to understand, my children have hand-picked, you have hand-picked, they really have not hand-picked their parents. <laughs> You have handpicked the parents my children need to make them more godly. Because if God is truly supplying every good thing, then our children are just one more blessing from him. And they are exactly the blessing we need. <laughs> wow. Who knew? Two thoughts. You could either talk to the person next to you. When are you most aware of your sacrifice? When are you most aware of your giving? Because you all are if you're parents. And if you're not parents, you are too. When are you most aware of your sacrifice? Or just lean to the person next to you and just start thanking God. In the area of parenting, in the area of your children or not. You don't have to talk about it. Just lean across and start. You don't even have to know them because Ed has kissed a man in Middlesbrough Stadium. <laughs> okay? Two options. You pick what one you need to do. We're very nearly at the home reach. Okay? This is the last question, the last discussion. Four minutes. Off you go. Okay. Uh, there is a roving mic. And we could ask some questions or offer some excellent insights. Or just poor insights, so I haven't set the bar too high. Uh, does anyone just want to raise your hand uh, if you say to say a question, a thought? We're, uh, you know, we're five minutes away from the end. Now's your moment. Uh, thanks very much. I, I've got one who's a little under two, and I, I, I can totally see what you mean about how formative those, those years are, and yet all of my discipline, all of my conversations with her feel like pantomime. Yes, <laughs> uh, yes. How do, how do I go about that yeah. in a way that gets to the heart? Okay, I first want to say you're the only one who finds that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just as I've suspected. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm just very sorry. Um, well, well done, well done. I think the, the first thing to know is that, is that maybe under the age of seven, they're only concrete thinkers. They can only understand things that they can see, draw, touch, or hug. So under seven, uh, you know, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to explain things. But that's when they're learning the most. So that, that's why with, you know, <laughs> we know under fives, 
the conversations are very short. You know, there, there are particularly some American parenting books. And after reading the second page with your under five, you're thinking, wow, you know, that's a lot for them to take in. I've, I've honestly no. So it's very short conversations. And by conversation, I mean pantomime with three sentences that ends in a hug. And you press the hands together inside of yours and say, I'm going to pray now. And you say, dear father, thank you that you're kind when we get it wrong. Amen. Uh, but uh, the biggest impact you're having is your consistent love and your care and you're there. Well done. Anyone else? Well, that's good. Oh, no. What, there's one, one at the front and there's one at the back. Start with this one here. Where are we? Sorry, go again. Yes. Well, I was just going to make an observation. Yeah. Um, on your chart about how many people come to of people who do come to faith come to faith very early yes and all our focus on how to bring people to faith yes is always based on the the adults or at least the teenagers yes um and when we're we're thinking about that some something i've i've often said that when we are talking to adults about God, the first thing we start with is trying to explain to people that God loves them. Yeah. And that is a big deal that grown-ups find it really difficult to grasp. Yes. But babies yeah. accept love yeah. from everyone. And, uh, you, have, yeah. you, you have to learn that you're not lovely. Thank you. And by the time, well, some people learn that in the first year of their lives, and that's a tragedy. Most people have learnt it by the time they get to secondary school. Thank you. And so we don't have to teach the small children that, but we don't have to, but we have to try not to destroy that. Thank you. If you take the microphone to the back, just while I, I thank you very much for, for that observation. Uh, you know, you could wonder to yourselves, pick, pick your friend of your age who isn't a Christian. You know, what would you have given for that friend to have grown up in a Christian home and not even become a Christian? But just, just for that framework to have been built. Thank you very much. J. John isn't here giving his seminars on evangelism, so I get to say we should do all the evangelism with kids. Yes. Morning. Um, one, one thing that I've always thought, I've always, the, the Proverbs 26, to me... <laughs> Uh, has always seemed too, too, too broad because I've known so many parents who've got teenage kids that have gone away from the faith and they've been brought up in the faith and the parents pray for, pray for their kids. I mean, it's one thing I absolutely dread. I've got two boys and, 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 and I just so hope that they don't drift, drift, drift away and, 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 you know, like from the age of 13... And um, I'm just, I'm just saying. I mean, is there? I mean, I'm just saying. I'm questioning Proverbs Thank 26. You. Thank you very much. I'm really pleased you raised that. It's the perfect place to finish. It's, it's just helpful to know this. We believe this to be a spiritual work. This is a spiritual work, and the Bible and the data says this spiritual work happens in homes, really well. But because it's a spiritual work, it's not predictable by us all the time. That, that, that's why the Bible is always going to be our best parenting manual. Because there is not a parenting manual that should ever say, if you do this, your children will be Christians. And it's why those parents in our churches who have Christian grown-up kids, they get to offer us great insight, but so do the ones whose kids aren't Christians. Because we don't blame them for it, because it's a spiritual work. To be a Christian parent, above all else, is to trust God with our children today as well as eternally. Thank you for that. Uh, it would be remiss of me if I didn't... Uh, that's tomorrow. I'm going to get there. You're wondering what on earth could that be, and I'll show you. If you're a parent here today, can I just point you to... Two things. The first is our podcasts. We do two types of podcasts. This is one that's just come out. 
in our Who Am I series. These are podcasts for the whole family to listen to. They take 20 minutes. The rest of your six hour journey home from Keswick is entirely yours. <laughs> They're designed for sort of five to 13 year olds. If you know, don't know what a podcast is, talk to the person next to you. It's a radio show without a radio station. Very simple. Search for Faith in Kids. You'll find the kids ones and you'll find the, whoop, you'll find the parents ones. The parents are just the parents to listen to, dealing with everyday topics. This one was the first one we touched on with sexuality. We got not one complaint. It became our most listened to episode but no one shared it on social media. That feels significant. Faith in Kids is trying to help parents deal with the hardest topics that parents need to be talking about and want to be talking about, but are finding it hard. One for the family, one for parents. Both if you search for Faith in Kids. If you go to uh, the Ten of Those bookshop, you'll find two books of family Bible times that I've written. I think they're absolutely great. <laughs> I leave them to you. That's somewhere you can go for parents. If you're here with a church, uh, we, uh, we have just started to produce. Uh, I thought I had it, but I don't. Uh, these are a, a taster of a series we're bringing out at the end of September called Who Am I? Looking at identity. This is the introduction, the first unit. I have a box of them on the stage. They're free to download from our website. If you want to take one to have a look at what we're producing at the moment for churches, please come up. It'd be great to see you. I'm going to pray. If you walk out while my eyes are shut, I won't know. <laughs> Dear Father, we thank you for parents. We thank you that you invented them. We thank you for children. They are all yours. You made them. And we pray, Father, that as their loving creator, you would also become their heavenly father. We lay our children before you as we lay our parenting before you. And we pray, Father, you would do a mighty work in us and them. And thank you for those who join with us on that journey who are here today. I pray, Father, we would raise the next generation to be thankful to you. Amen. Thanks very much.